How old is crowdsourcing as a term? Anybody know? Any guesses? Yes, that's right. Uh, Wired Magazine, 2006, came together with the word crowdsourcing. But you actually um, provided a good insight, which is, crowds what is crowdsourcing? Like, what's crowdsourcing? If you really think about it, it's it's when you it's an open call. I mean, what's an what's a closed call? So I don't even know what the word open. It's a call for somebody to solve a problem that you want solved, or a group. Sometimes you're crowdsourcing for one idea. Sometimes you're crowdsourcing a crowd. Um, but we've been crowdsourcing for a long, long time. Uh, there's a rich history. And now it's new and sexy. But the question, what makes crowdsourcing crowdsourcing is real simple. It's the internet. We've created this technology called the global internet. And a lot of visionaries and futurists see this huge potential of us using the internet to collaborate at scales never before seen. That's called crowdsourcing. And yet, the world remains stubbornly ordinary and normal. And so a lot of people are asking the question, well, when is crowdsourcing going to go mainstream? That's what I'm going to talk about today. And in a small presentation of 230 slides, you're not going to do 230 slides. I got 32 slides. Um, I'm going to go through and give you a whirlwind tour about what we've learned in the five years we've been doing here at about crowdsourcing. Now, this, um, this book um, and these, these two MIT professors who actually coined the term technological unemployment, you guys heard the word, that word? Yeah. They, this is their follow up book, um, Machine Platform Crowd, where they cover the three mega trends um, of our era machine learning, AI, et cetera, et cetera platform business model and the power of platforms and the power of the crowd which is pretty incredible and this is uh, this is my visualization of what they've talked about in their book and I'll um, I highly recommend you read the book but the, the, the kind of core message is this um, they use the word core to represent the modern organization whether it's a government or a company or whatever um, and they go out of their way to really um, extol the virtues of, of the organization as an invention. Organizations are powerful. We use them every, in every aspect of our society, and they do some incredible things. They can also do a lot of damage and, and cause problems. And their point is that the crowd's not going to replace the core, um, but, and the, the core is not going to survive without the crowd, but it's the two together that's the secret sauce. The, what they call core plus crowd. So this is my kind of visualization of what that looks like, and you know we're starting to see this everywhere. You know, you look at um, Uber crowdsources um, drivers, right? They crowdsource rides. Um, they've got a core plus crowd strategy, right? Um, Airbnb, same thing. Even Google, you know, uses crowdsource data, page rank data, in order to provide the best search engine, but they also have a strong core. So that's really the model. I think everybody understands the basics of crowdsourcing. As I talked about, it's you know it's really uh, in essence the simplest kind of model possible. Um, you know, it's really about creating a game for uh, a job and and uh, allowing the crowd to self, you know, self motivate, self organize, self manage, self report. Um, that's the power of crowdsourcing versus let's say you know freelancing or outsourcing. Um, we focus on crowdsourcing knowledge work. Uh, knowledge work is the only thing that's really growing uh, in the economy is the knowledge economy, and it represents the greatest hope for um, for really pulling the world into you know a, a, the lifestyle I think we all hope that people can get to. It's not going to be manufacturing. It's not going to be agriculture. Um, it's not going to be tourism. It's going to be helping developing countries um, join the knowledge economy. That's the most important um, thing or the biggest impact that we can have. Now, crowdsourcing is everywhere. Um, X Prize is talking in the other room about what they're doing. Um, you know, we've got um, Kraft Foods, Deloitte's been doing crowdsourcing for almost 10 years now. Uh, we've got crowdsourcing um, also, Lego was talked about today. So, crowdsourcing is really everywhere. And um, even if your organization isn't crowdsourcing, the crowd is crowdsourcing. So, anybody who here has heard of Glassdoor? Yeah, you could, I've been in rooms with CEOs where I'm like, who hears it at Glassdoor? And they're like, what? Oh, you're in trouble. 
Um, so the crowd is already evaluating your company, whether you ask them to or not. That's the power of crowdsourcing. It's, it is slipping into every organization. And what's powering the, 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 the need for organizations to adopt crowdsourcing is you know this digital economy we're in, where everything moves at internet time. Now, who here is a millennial or I'm 35 or under? Anyone? Yeah. So you, this, you guys are born. You guys were born. You got. I call you guys the digital natives. You're the digital natives. Anybody older than that? We're the analog natives, and we split into two groups. We're we've got digital immigrants. I'm a digital immigrant. That's yeah, so why I immigrated, and I. I'm, I've joined the digital world. I'm a, I'm, I've been fully acclimatized. And then you've got the analog natives that are want to stay analog. And they're terrified. They don't know what to do. Anybody heard of these companies? Yeah. Um, you know, each of these companies had lots of warning. Right? Kodak invented the digital camera. Yeah, so there's real mindset, there's a real need for innovation. Um, the pain is being felt. This is a, a PwC's CEO survey. Um, you can see the, the number one pain, innovation. This is not, I didn't touch this slide, this is their slide. Human capital and digital and technical capabilities. These are three really good use cases for crowdsourcing. And that really leads to uh, um, the organizational innovation paradox, which is basically um, organizations are um, have a big staff and their job is to solve problems. Problems that don't get solved by the organization trickle up the org chart um, until they can't trickle up anymore, which tends to be the executive suite. And there they fester until there's a solution found. And many CEOs and leaders um, can really resonate with this. So what's happening? Well, um, I'm going to use cloud, cloud computing as a, an analog here. And in order to understand how crowdsourcing is going mainstream, when it doesn't look like it's going mainstream yet, you have to understand the adoption curve. And it's beyond the scope today to get into the adoption curve too much. But the important thing is to remember that almost all products go through this adoption curve. The enthusiasts, for example, who here remembers the first iPhone, the very, very first iPhone? Yeah. It was, who was um, a great school no, no. Um, So the enthusiasts were the ones that camped out overnight outside the Apple store to buy a product they've never even seen or touched. Those are the enthusiasts. Every product, every startup has them. And then you go through into the visionaries. They're the ones that are willing to take a risk on your product to gain a strategic advantage in the marketplace. And then, of course, you have to get into the mainstream, and that's the hard part. Who here recognizes this? The hype curve. So this is what it looks like when you kind of merge them. Okay. And so whether it's blockchain, AI, crowdsourcing, they're all going to go through this curve, and it's that trough of disillusionment um, where you see how it looks like really pessimistic. The most pessimistic it looks is the day before we're about to like have a huge mainstream adoption. This is a really common pattern you see in a lot of places. Uh, for example, this is Oracle, Eric Larry Ellison, um, and he said, right, and this was in uh, 2008, 2008, okay? And he specifically poo-pooed Salesforce. Ah, oh, you know, they're not even profitable. You know, they're not gonna make it. Well, they made it. They, you know, Salesforce is far exceeded Oracle and cloud computing, hello, like like is the like who here has bought software that like on a disk or like yeah, it's silly. So, you know, it tends to be misunderstood by the experts is my point. Um, and by the way, this is the twenty seventeen hype curve, and if you see do I have a laser pointer? Oh, look at that. There's crowdsourcing right there. So maybe a little early, but still, um, I think it's pretty solid. Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to throw this out. Real, I really love these. This is Google's, this is before they were evil, by the way. Um, this is Google's Colors of Innovation. Um, they've since changed them. They've, they've um, made them, they've made them very uh, 
brand friendly, but these are the original ones. So I like it, focus on the user, open wins, open wins, great idea. Ideas can come from anywhere. Just think about these from a crowdsourcing standpoint. They're pretty cool. So what's gonna power, what is powering crowdsourcing and the mainstream adoption well? Um, it's this, who knows what this is? Demographics, right? Um, demographics, and uh, demographics explain a ton. You could, um, uh, not that I've done this, but you could put a really good art, um, argument together that um, a lot of the big um, internet platforms have been driven by demographics, right? Um, who, who here has heard of Dropbox? Right, well, when the millennials were in school, right, and they needed digital files for the first time because high, they were, you know, analog high school, like an, high school was analog for them, and they went to college, oh, I get to use a computer? Oh, oh, I need files? So, you know, Ruth Houston, the founder of Dropbox, invented Dropbox to solve his own problem of why do I need to have a physical thing for my digital files is retarded, right? Well, what you don't know or might not know is that Dropbox was like the 200th cloud storage company. In fact, um, the first use case for the internet was, oh, we can store our files in the cloud. But the analog natives didn't like that. They wanted to touch and feel their digital files. Um, Dropbox um, became Dropbox because of timing and they understood the use case well enough to understand that no features are required. Just freaking put the, the files in the cloud and make them available on any endpoint. Really simple, $8 million company. Um, you could go through, well, why, why did Uber become successful? The millennials need to get around, and they couldn't afford a car. Airbnb, millennials are traveling, right? Just go through all of them, Tinder. Millennials went through puberty. Grinder. Millennials came out of the closet. I expected some laughs. Um, so, you know, what's really happening here? Well, one, another important thing is millennials play video games. Right? Millennials love being scored and measured. They love playing games as long as the game is fair. So crowdsourcing has the ideal environment for a workforce that's that's comfortable and happy and friendly doing crowdsourcing both on the sponsor side and the um, and the uh, solver side. Now, what makes crowdsourcing work? Um, it's got to be authentic. Millennials can smell inauthenticity from a mile away. Um, millennials, how many like your grandma forwards a fake news article or like oh yeah you know. Um, if you don't share this post, Facebook will own all your photos, right? Yeah, millennials can smell that stuff from a mile away. They, um, they can tell when you're faking. It's got to be real. It's got to be real to the brand. It's got to be an authentic crowdsourcing project. You've got to be sharing your real problems, your real pain, be open and honest. That's what makes crowdsourcing work. Um, and, and leveraging your brand. And really what's power in crowdsourcing? Well, it's this. This is really the, this, if you... I get a volunteer, if I crack open your brain and show the contents, this is what it looks like. Okay, this is the millennial mindset. Does anybody disagree? The millennials, more than any other generation, okay, um, see that, uh, you know, they want to um, find what they love, find what they're good at, and what's a problem that people want solved, okay? And that's what they're looking for. That's why in job interviews, um, you know, millennials often show up as entitled to the older generations. Why? Because they're just trying to do this. They're just asking, they're asking questions. They're like, I'm not just taking any job. I'm a Gen Xer, right? I went through the recessions of the 80s and 90s. Those were nasty shit, man. It was tough. You would beg for a job, okay? Yeah, it's like a, my childhood experience was like, you know, 15 years of living at Woodstock, you know Woodstock? Uh, three days after the party ended, right? That's the Gen Xers right there. So we've also got a huge explosion in expertise, right? So 90% of all the scientists who've ever lived are alive today. So think of all the inventions of yesteryear, 
were done by a tiny fraction of the cognitive horsepower that we have today. It's it really truly incredible. And yet, these the millennials, more than anything, are underengaged, underemployed, they're not invited to the party. Um, they're, they're, they're told they've got to earn their due, go through the ranks, blah, blah, blah. Um, they're not interested in doing that. Um, they want to find they want to find what they want and they want to work on it and they in many ways represent one of the most effective workforces that we've seen in the history of humanity again a topic for another day um, so you know we've uh, taken all the best practices around crowdsourcing and put it into crowdsourcing 2.0 um, and um, so I'm not going to go through all the details but um, I'll just call historical crowdsourcing um, was really kind of like treating the crowd as like a product, like e-commerce, right? Like inventory, right? And then you can kind of buy it, right? Now, a lot of um, platforms are pivoting to be more Crowd 2.0. Crowd 2.0 is not a hero proprietary thing. It's like Web 2.0, which millennials probably like, what? what's Web 2.0? Web 2.0 was the analog web. It sucked stinky bum. It really did. Anybody remember, like, Webmail before Gmail? Anyone? Oh my effing god, that sucked. It was like going to the dentist every day. Um, and then Gmail kind of, Gmail by the way, was kind of like the web 2.0, like debutante, you know, like it's like, hey, yeah, you can do it this way. And now, you know, that's just revolutionized software. Anyway, so the web needed web 2.0 to become the web it is now. Um, my belief is that we need to understand the best practices for crowdsourcing, that's Crowd 2.0. So that's what we're doing, and we kind of put it into this, this is like a, how you talk to consultants. Right? So if you want to talk to a consultant, you got to give them like the grid, right? And you got to put all the other buzzwords in there. And map it together, it's true, yeah, it's true. So, you know, everybody's like all excited about this, right, the whole AI thing. You know, what's really crazy is like, hello, what about like, OI, you know what OI is? Organic intelligence, I know, quite good. Um, so, you know, we've got this huge, you know, intelligence, and what the hell are we doing with the AI thing, right? Like, so AI is really good at, at automating repetitive tasks and all that, and maybe it will take over the world, maybe it will. I think it's going to take a long time. Um, in the meantime, let's tap into the intel collective intelligence of the planet. I mean, doesn't that just make sense? So, you know, we've done projects like this. Facebook challenge, so authentic, right? This was called the sanitary micro. This is a NASA project we did, um, and we, we get credit for the name. We went. Oh, by the way, we should record that, right? Go to the bunch of NASA engineers and go. Yeah, we want to change your big acronym project to space poop, and they were like, "Is that a joke?" No, no, it's not a joke. So we did it. It was hugely successful. Uh, we made it fun. We made it authentic. And we had huge engagements, and not only we had huge, huge, huge engagement, we had an engagement. Well, you guys are a tough crowd. So, so you know, this is um, so this is the mindset uh, that um, makes crowdsourcing work. You know, it's amazing how, um, like, you know, I've heard from a lot of the other generation that you know millennials are entitled and blah blah blah. Now they're willing to work hard. Millennials, uh, by by actual like cold hard metrics and surveys, are the hardest working generation. Um, believe it or not, you can tell this. You can you can tell you can tell them Christians said this. Um, you know, if you take your average twenty eight year old millennial and you compare it to a twenty year old baby boomer, you guys are working more hours. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's certainly not a lazy behavior. Okay, so um, ditto for the Gen Xers. So um, contrary to popular belief um, and the selfies, um, the millennials are hardworking. They're willing to work hard. And they're also willing to pay their dues. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So, um, you know, what we want to do is create a platform that's going to help everybody find their hero's journey. And, um, you know, one of the things about Hero X, and I'll probably wrap because I think I'm at time. We're getting close to time. Um, um, one of the things about HeroX is we're really trying to create a platform of platforms 
Um, we um, rejected the idea that we were building a Herox crowd because we don't believe that that's what the world needs. Right? There's a lot of expert communities. And those expert communities like OpenIDO, like Top Coder, and others, they're awesome. They're, they're, they're essential to the success of crowdsourcing. We need lots of structure and a rich ecosystem for crowdsourcing to work. No one platform is going to make it work. Why? Because crowdsourcing is a labor model that sits alongside freelancing and in-house people, right? The core plus crowd. Crowdsourcing complements um, employment in the other models. Um, it helps organizations be more successful. It brings the innovations that they need in raw, unfinished forms that give the in-house teams new products to launch, new customers to service. It's a win-win. And so really that's our model. Um, you know, the core of our business is to help everybody find their, their hero's journey and, um, you know, and get away from the bad old days before we had computers and the internet where we had to manage people. We don't want to manage people anymore. This is, uh, anybody heard of Taylorism? So this was uh, during the Industrial Revolution, the invention of the title manager. You know that before this, there really wasn't a concept of a manager. Managers like, I'll do all the thinking, We'll do workers, and then I'll tell you what to do. And that worked really well in, in an industrial environment, you know, manufacturing, assembly lines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've inherited it into the knowledge economy simply because that's what we're used to. But most organ I should say most, most or many organizations, especially tech organizations, are starting to realize that Taylorism, tr traditional managing, is not the winning strategy. However, a lot of organizations are struggling with that change. And you guys have seen stuff like this um, and the future. And so crowdsourcing is just the outside application of a lot of these trends and changes that you're seeing. The use of technology to empower people. Uh, it's not a race to the bottom. It's a race to everybody finding their true talent and an application. And I believe that as it becomes mainstream, um, it provides an avenue for anybody, anywhere, no matter what their skin color is, or their gender, or what country they live in, um, to shine their brightest, to join the um, knowledge economy, and to live a life that's free of poverty and other bad things. If we do that, it can solve a huge number of problems in the world. Any questions? Questions? So you guys do competition, right? We do crowdsourcing. Um, we do collaborative crowdsourcing and competitive crowdsourcing. Although, just like you know, Amazon uh, started with books before they went to other things. Um, our focus right now is on open innovation, which often is a prize-based model, with, with where competition is more important than collaboration. Um, but we are we are going to you know as we get our brand into a global leadership position. We're going to move into uh, more and more what looks more and more like gigs. Right. So, like a collaboration model. Yes. How do you ensure fairness when, at the end of the day, one person or a small group of people probably bring the final product when a hundred or a thousand or more contributed to the entire thing? Yeah. If you ever played sports, like you know, like softball or something. And maybe how many other teams were there in your league? Lots of teams. Yeah, and did you play just you know because you wanted to win? No. No, you played because you wanted to play. Yeah. So the important and, and this is brought back to the authenticity thing. Brands who think oh this is a good this is a good way to you know to be cheap save money that they're they're not understanding the the purpose of, of open innovation right now the thing about innovation is you. you Depending on the size of the breakthrough, it it's correlates strongly to the number of failures. Right? So if you want a big breakthrough, you have to generate hundreds or thousands of failures. There's no other way to innovate. And if you know a better way to innovate, then invite me to your super yacht and kind of ride your helicopter. Right? Because um, it, innovation is hard. It requires failure. Now, if I want blog posts, let's say I just don't want to write blog posts anymore. Can I crowdsource blog posts? 
Well, that's you know that starts looking like gigs, right? So we use a reputation model, okay, to gamify that in a way that we we create what's called income agency, which is a fancy term for meaning um, that I've got control over getting paid, as opposed to open innovation where I have little control over getting paid because there's so my submissions will be judged and I might get nothing, right? But on HeroX from day one, we've always made sure that there's no IP transfer without payment. And there's full transparency, so everybody knows the rules of the game and it's fair. So even on that space boot challenge where we had 20,000 innovators, we expected 500. We had 20,000. So the 20,000 solver, do you think he was like joining going, yeah, they're all stupid, I'm going to win. I'm doing this because you know, I want to get paid. No, they were doing it to join something. Many of them had hobbies. Maybe they were a biomedical student and wanted to do something interesting. Maybe they were hobbyists and they'd rather you know, take their hobby out of the garage and online and share. There's a hundred reasons to, to participate. We track all this carefully. We actually care more about the, the satisfaction of our crowd than we do our companies. Um, you know, the brand Hero X is, is facing the crowd. Um, our secret is Hero X is focused on empowering the talent. And our future, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say this, is a future of a liquid marketplace where people's true talents um, are measured, where no matter where you are and who you are, if you want to join the digital economy and do something, you don't have to ask anybody's permission. You don't have to live in San Francisco. You don't have to apply for a job and have a resume or have a degree. You can just go and do it and prove your prove your talent. And what that will do, that liquid market will create um, a, a world where companies are now competing against each other for access to the talent, and that creates um, a rise of income. So rather than a race to the bottom, like um, if you look at a lot of platforms like Upwork, and I don't want to poo-poo anybody, but Look at Upwork. You know, I hear a lot of um, business managers go, "Oh yeah, we used Upwork. I found this Ukrainian web developer for thirteen dollars an hour. Yeah, freaking awesome. Yeah, grind that guy. Come on, you know." So a lot of these kind of one things are kind of a race to the bottom. They're they're somewhat exploitive, and then you end up with a real um, quality problems. Um, and you know, anybody who's used Upwork more than once can really see that. Um, so I'm not a believer in the race to the bottom. We want to be the race to the best um, and create a situation where everybody can earn you know, middle class income by doing something that they're good at and practice and having an opportunity to do that. An uncredentialized um, marketplace. That's the key to crowdsourcing, is uncredentialized marketplace. And, um, and that doesn't mean the transaction is not credentialized, okay, but participation is open. Um, It'll be a while before we start promising income to the crowd. We will get there, and it will be authentic, and it will be measured, and we'll share all the data. But right now, uh, contests give people an opportunity to punctuate their career, differentiate themselves, practice and train, um, participate. Participation, by the way, is half, half of it, right? Um, right now, people, without crowdsourcing, where are they going to go? You know, where are they going to start? They can't get a job. You know, if I, if I you know, Worked in a restaurant and now I've learned, you know, coding. Where do I start? And I live in, you know, I'm not going to name a country, but in a country that doesn't have a strong digital economy. Where? How am I going to go? So crowdsourcing is right now today on Hero X. It's more about punctuating your career, more about finding things that you're interested in doing um, that you care about, you're choosing, than it is uh, income stream. But within our success, we will enable um, a global liquid marketplace for knowledge work. Um, the, that transcends geography, all this work visa and immigration crap. No, digital digital economy. The okay. digital economy is everywhere, right? I mean, if you're in a Wi-Fi zone, it's bouncing off your skull, right? So why do we need? You know, why do we have this kind of physical mindset? Digital economy transcends borders, but there is no global liquid marketplace. We're hoping that we're going to seed that. We're going to catalyze that and be part of that solution.